I move that we accept the meeting of minutes or do you need to start again from the beginning? Um, I'll just, I'll do the quick, uh, it is 531 on October 5th, 2020. Um, this is a Keisha Farms monthly meeting and it meets the governor's executive order related to uh, meetings. Therefore, we are recording uh, for posterity purposes. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Chairwoman Cindy Greenblatt. All right, good evening, everyone. If you all received the minutes, um, it, was there anybody who had any additions or corrections to the minutes? Yeah. Okay, then I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Thank you, Jim. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, thank you, Dan. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand or signal somehow. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so the minutes are approved. Um, on the agenda tonight, we have open issues, old business. And, uh, I think we have something that's going to get you all excited tonight about possibilities and potential. Um, Gary had a brilliant idea, I, and it's not his first, but this was a really good one. He contacted <laughs> the University of Hartford to see about the possibility of the Barney School and the other schools perhaps there that uh, have students that are looking for internships that might be able to function as our consultants, or at least in the same manner that our consultants were proposing to us. To, to function. And so he sent the request for proposal over. You will, um, let me introduce Brooke Penders first. All right, she is right there on your screens. Um, Brooke, will you just introduce yourself and give us your official like title and position and everything? Thank sure, you. hi, good evening everybody. Um, I'm Brooke Penders, I'm a proud Weathersfield resident. I'm also the Executive Director of Career and Professional Development at the University of Hartford. Um, I started there just about two years ago and was charged by President Woodward to take our very transactional um, career office and turn it into a transformational dynamic place where students could explore, prepare, and transition for their lives after college, whether they, that meant a profession or graduate school. Um, and I work in conjunction with um, spectacular faculty and staff like Kevin Sweeney, um, our dedicated and enthusiastic alums like Gary Evans and um, a brilliant and excited um, industry and employer um, <laughs> in the region. And we are most excited about working with organizations that um, have Connecticut roots. We would love for our students to stay here and be part of the Connecticut economy. All right, so thank you, Brooke. Um, and then Kevin, uh, Kevin Sweeney, you can see on your screen as well. Gary and I were able to meet with both Brooke and Kevin kind of in a preliminary meeting on Friday. Kevin, would you mind just introducing yourself as well? Thank you. Thank, uh, again, my name is Kevin Sweeney. I'm the Assistant Dean for Collaborative Initiatives in the Barney School of Business. And uh, I have been, I'm compared to Brooke, I'm a newbie. I've been with the University of Hartford for just a little over a year. Uh, in prior to that, I, I was a faculty member of what's called a professor of practice at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, uh, which was the, which is really one of the original homes of experiential learning, which is really at the heart of tonight's conversation. Um, and as a professor of practice is, it's a simple way to say I was somebody who didn't go off and get a PhD and research his life, but spent most of his career uh, in, in some form of practice. Mine was at Mass Mutual. I had a 20 year career there, most recently leading mergers and acquisitions and prior to that uh, leading um, as the, or serving as the chief operating officer of our international life insurance operations. But my focus has been since teaching, finding ways for st our students, whether here or at WPI, um, to be able to have hands-on experiences. And the nice thing is learning from my prior experience and here that students not only get a chance to have hands-on experiences when they work with um, partners like Weathersfield, but they actually tend to bring a tremendous amount of value too, because the insight that students, young students bring, the, the sort of questions they'll ask usually drive outcomes you wouldn't necessarily expect, high quality outcomes. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what, how we approach experiential learning, but uh, that's kind of why I'm here, both to represent the Barney School, which will provide some of the students, uh, but also as one of the leads on experiential learning at the university in general. 
All right, well, thank you. Your background couldn't be better suited for this project because this probably was the town's biggest acquisition in a long time. And we really need your help and expertise in making it an experiential learning experience for your students and for our community, both. So thank you. Gary, what did I forget? Anything? No, I think, I think that was good. Um, okay. I, I especially like the part where you said my idea was brilliant. Um, That's in the minutes, Mary, right? <laughs> yep, got it. Good. Um, no, I, I think that's great. Um, and uh, granted, yes, I'll admit I did reach out because they alma, are my alma mater, but um, also because of their ability. Uh, Brooke is a great contact and connection. Um, and in the spirit of what we're trying to achieve here, it almost made sense to be able to reach out um, because this is a true community project and there are youth who are part of our community um, and there's pathways that need to be created for them and whether they're Weathersfield students or students somewhere else, um, this opportunity would create a pathway for people to learn um, and apply knowledge um, that they gain. So I can't think of a better partnership um, than with a community partnering with a, with a university um, that has breadth. And as I think I've said to Kevin and Brooke, and I know Cindy on the call, um, when I went there, it was called All University Curriculum or AUC. Um, and the intent was that each student had to do a certain amount of time that sounds like prison time, and it felt like prison time, uh, but time in different areas outside of their expertise just so they would have exposure. So, you know, I spent time in engineering classes and in business classes with other individuals who were in business and engineering classes, and you work together in teams to understand. So what I could bring to the table um, on a conversation about international uh, business development was, was different. I came from a political perspective or a governing perspective, but they came from a, you know, a capitalistic approach or, or a bottom line number and how to, how to leverage systems. Um, so I always thought that was a great opportunity. It sounds like um, this takes that concept and applies it to real life hands-on. So I'm, I'm just happy we can be at this point um, to try to move something forward. All right, so in doing that, Gary sent the request for proposal to both Brooke and Kevin, and then we had a just kind of a preliminary Zoom meeting on Friday in which they kind of asked questions of us, what we were looking for, and then they brainstormed with each other to try and see what they could come up with. And they have a short presentation for us tonight in which they wanted to try and express to the committee how they could see this project moving forward and what their unique roles would be in it. Do, are you able to show the PowerPoint, Gary? Okay, great. I, I am, but hang on one second because I had to reboot and uh, prior to this, I meeting, can, you can prior share to this meeting and I forgot to bring it back up. So give me I a minute. I can also second. do it. Yeah, it uh, looks, like, uh, looks like we can share. I have it sitting here if you want me to share yep. the drive. It might, it might be better if you do simply because it looked like you had a number where you actually had to click a button to bring the slide down, so. Yes, very so fancy fine. animations. So I will just put, bring it to slideshow and then Brooke, I can drive for you and, and then I'm, I think I have the second half of the slides. So. Okay, terrific. Sounds good. So you'll see on your screen a, a beautiful view of our um, campus that sits at the intersection of three Greater Hartford towns, West Hartford, Bloomfield, and Hartford, um, which makes some building projects very interesting. But for the most part, we love where we're located because we are just minutes from downtown. We um, are just minutes from the state capitol. We are able to access major um, corporations, um, uh, suppliers, aerospace suppliers, small business, entrepreneurs, um, not-for-profits. We provide our students with just an incredible array of uh, professional experiences um, and potential networks. Next slide, if you would, please, Kevin. So the University of Hartford is made up of seven schools and colleges. Um, our College of Arts and Sciences is our largest. Um, the Barney School of Business. Um, CETA, which is the College of Engineering, Technology, and Architecture. We also have uh, the Education, Nursing, and Health Professions. We are now offering a, uh, a full RN program and building a new collaborative center 
uh, for technology um, that will benefit those many of those programs. The Hartford Art School, um, the Hart School, which is one of the country's oldest conservatories, um, and Hillier College. Um, our school was actually uh, began as the culmination of those last three um, and still very much drives a lot of alumni support and connections. But as Gary said, it is not unheard of to see students um, collaborating with each other across these seven schools and colleges. Um, Kevin's expertise especially provides opportunities for students to apply what we consider our competencies that we want all students to graduate, having some experiences, some competencies in all of these areas. And whether they get that through a formal experience, like what we're going to propose to you tonight, or through a campus job, or through a student leadership role, we feel as these are all things that every student needs to have something that they can speak to in a postgraduate interview application um, and that will really drive their success post college. Um, and they include critical thinking, um, oral and written communications, teamwork and collaboration, digital technology, which is changing by the day, leadership and we're finding more and more opportunities for students to participate there, professionalism and work ethic, um, career management, which we all know can change at a drop of a hat as we've all experienced during the pandemic. No one was less familiar with Zoom than I was and now here I am sometimes running Zoom meetings. And then what are we doing about making sure that we're comfortable interacting with people um, and issues from across the globe? Um, we have found that all of these are really applicable to creating and fostering experiential learning partnerships. Um, sometimes these are often on the fly when someone you know calls up and says, would you like to work on a project with us? But we have someone like Kevin who has significant experience with this, who has come in and put a wonderful framework around it so that we can start doing these um, more um, deliberately and engaging the right kinds of students for the right kinds of opportunities. And we're really excited about being able to do that with the town of Wethersfield. So I will let Kevin share a little bit about his vision for this program and how we would collaborate with the town. Great. Thanks, Brooke. Um, so when we talk about experiential learning, just to be clear, experiential learning is an emphasis both on the experience and the learning. So this is the intersection of hands-on activities, but it's there is, as Brooke said, a really disciplined process to it. One that empowers students to really make a difference in terms of solving real-world problems, but also there is a, there's a, to use a sort of academics term, pedagogy, or there's a, there's a curricular approach to it that, that uh, allows for us to be sure that the students are learning something, but also that you'll, you'll get a quality um, product in the end. First of all, um, the, this approach really kind of runs successfully at the University of Hartford because even though we're bringing new discipline to the, the model, uh, there is a long-standing history at the University of Hartford of doing experiential learning. There have been interdisciplinary project teams, um, as Gary said, uh, internally that, you know, for many years there's been interdisciplinary work, but there's also been engagement with the community for in what is historically been referred to as service learning, but it's much broader than that. Where now we focus on real world operational challenges, strategic challenges, and we work with the for-profit, for non-profit, and public sector. Um, and so we have a range of partners and essentially ultimately teams that are run by students. So you'll see Brooke and me around once we start working with you, but it's really the students that take the lead. Uh, and then advisors, in the form of faculty like me and other faculty who help drive from behind the scenes the, the, the learning components. I kind of frame it like working with a consulting firm where you have the frontline consultants. Those are the students. They're doing the real work. Uh, and the faculty advisors are sort of the equivalent of senior partners who both begin the engagement but also serve to make sure that the work is of a quali high quality uh, and meets um, our partners' needs. There's really a few things that are critical and there are a range of different types of experiential learning. There are, you can have internships, you can have um, single discipline project teams, you can have uh, a, a host of other examples. 
what we're what we're thinking of is primarily project-based learning involving an interdisciplinary team. That said, we will probably have some student interns, internal interns who will be involved in the early stages, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But uh, project-based learning is by definition always team-based. So you're not going to have one student working on this. You'll have multiple students, and in some phases, even multiple teams. We'll talk about that in a moment. There's a level of academic rigor that is expected. So students who are engaged in these projects in one way or another have some skin in the game. That could be for their, their for credit. It could be for to meet a specific set of requirements for graduation. Um, but these are the students are expected to contribute in a meaningful way. They're evaluated. We work with them to reflect on their learning. And there's a process. So when I say without getting into the science of it, but there is a, there's actually a framework by uh, an author named David Kolb, who's sort of the preeminent scholar in, in experiential learning that suggests it's more than just doing, it's doing, thinking, reflecting, um, experimenting, revising, so there's a cycle. And in that cycle, the students are able to really bring back a quality product. We, um, the process is, is definitely consultative. As I said, Brooke and I are gonna exit quickly. The students are gonna serve as the lead um, uh, experts and, and advisors, but they are gonna spend a lot of their time asking you and members of your community through information gathering sessions, questions. It's as much learning what you need that drives the outcomes. Relevant so that they're gonna, this isn't an, an academic experiment. Um, so even though it's academically rigor, rigorous, the focus is on driving outcomes that are useful for you. In this case, thinking about what would be meaningful for Keisha Farms and what will be relevant to your community. And as I said before, multidisciplinary. We expect that over the life cycle of this project, which is relatively short li life for a project, I and mean, we're talking less than a year total, actually several months, but a, a lot less than a year total, um, that we would have disciplines that include business, the arts, um, civil engineering, architectural design, um, certainly uh, the political science, economics, and disciplines around policy, and I suspect other disciplines that we haven't even thought about. But we, the, the idea is that the students learn how to work in partnership with other experts and they become a much stronger team because they bring their respective disciplines to the table. So that's a, sort of the basic process. There is a process to pulling one of these together and we've developed a very rough initial timeline based on the conversations that we had with, um, with Cindy and, and with Gary. So this is still very sort of open-ended in terms of, it, it can, it's subject to obviously negotiation, but even just a revision along the way. But we tried to capture at least some of the major themes. I think some of the big things in, that are, are critical here is that we're looking at a time horizon that starts effectively immediately and I'll go through each of these phases in a moment, um, but I'm gonna stop after I just describe at the high level. And really three phases. One is a setup phase. Phase two is uh, getting most of the work done, although it breaks into two parts, and we'll talk a bit about that. And then phase three, which would take place in the summer, would be to, to provide a final deliverable, but really by May, you're gonna know most of the outcomes. The final deliverable would be a written report. So our expectation is to provide you with a really quality report. And so that requires a level of intensity on its own. Um, but you're not going to get a lot of surprises in those last couple of months. The, re the real work is going to be completed. The hands-on interviews, engagement with the community, or et cetera, will occur between now and the end of the upcoming uh, academic semester. I do want to go through these details, but, um, but I, this is a very typical model that I've uh, used in the past. I, I think uh, I mentioned I've done some work at, at WPI. We, we actually, I set up a, a project center there that's worked with community real estate development and project uh, for, for a nonprofit that worked on very different, more urban properties, but basically the same set of issues. How do we develop properties that aren't necessarily typically going to be commercial properties, but are for community use? So this timeline kind of fits with some work that, we've, that I've been involved with in the past and allows the students to do a quality job and allows you to get the feedback and, and be in, in, involved in the, in the process. I'll go through the details in a moment, but I just wanted to kind of stop there because we've shared a lot and then we can go through kind of almost month by month, but 
share it a lot, both Brooke and I, um, just to see if there's any questions before we go into a deep dive uh, on the schedule. Not hearing any questions, I'll be glad to just kind of walk you through uh, each of the four uh, phases, which are really three with two sub phases, but um, resource, the, the phase one, the resources for the phase one, this is an example where right away we are confident. In fact, I, I was interviewing students last week for a series of, of uh, other internships and of at least one student who's quite interested, really impressive student uh, who's not in the business school, actually is uh, part of the, the Department of Political Science, a triple threat, economics, communication, and political science, along with a couple of minors. He is currently working in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office in New York. He's also been in the New York County District Attorney's Office and has worked in the mayor's office in New York City and um, is really excited about the idea of working on a project um, in a um, non-urban community. And so um, he, I think, along with probably a business student, would be uh, tasked with building a full formal response to the RFP. Uh, we will respond in the same way that your consultants have so that you'll have a sense of what you can expect in terms of outcomes and to develop a phase two project plan. That is a take this lattice work and build a series of, of clearly defined um, deliverables and expectations. And we'd expect to come back with at least an update um, uh, at your next meeting on November 2nd with the, those two key deliverables I just identified being delivered on December 1st. Um, so that would be what phase one would look like. Uh, so again, relatively small team with the idea that that allows us to define what we need in terms of resources. Do we need an, you know, an arts and design team? Do we need a team that can help with operational and finance, uh, marketing and communications team to help with community feedback, a variety of other skill sets. And for us to begin that recruitment process for students to be part of a multidisciplinary team uh, now so that they could be up and running with a kickoff expectation of around the 15th of January is roughly when we come back um, from our break. Uh, just to put into context, we officially are in hybrid mode um, to accommodate the COVID-19. That means most students are on campus right now, but as of uh, right before Thanksgiving, they go home, but we will continue to be uh, virtually av on a available on a remote or virtual basis through the end of the semester, which is the beginning of December. We hope to be in hybrid mode back in the spring and hybrid just means students split their time online in class so that we can have social distanced physical um, meetings. Uh, and during that period, we would start the team formation and we would by, by February 1st be prepared to bring the full student team to you for introduction. So you knew who was working for you and who's working on what. Um, and then we'd send them off to do the work, which uh, the first phase of work, which would be initial community feedback gathering, uh, focus groups. Uh, so that's critical to understand both your expectations, but your stakeholders' expectations. And then we would um, also have students involved in um, sort of best, best practices research an analytical framework looking at other communities. There's also some academic resources and other research resources that can help us kind of frame what's been done or what can be done and maybe some things that you haven't thought about before with the expectation that a, a first phase or phase 2A presentation would be for your March 1st, 2021 session. I've picked dates that I, I understand you meet first Monday of each month. So these are the first Monday a month dates. Um, and they'd come in and say, here's what we think this should look like roughly based on what we've heard get your feedback with the idea then, if that makes sense to go off and start doing some design analysis, working with design experts from our architectural design program, civil engineering, arts, uh, and then generate at least a series of working possible pr proposals, which would then go back out to community feedback sessions to say, here's a, that's where you start doing much more of a focus, much more focus group driven, which says, what if you did this? What if you did that? What, what would your reaction be to this? with the expectation that depending on your schedule, they would return on April 5th or May 3rd, which are your two uh, sessions toward the end of our semester with the hope that they have a kind of rough, that presentation would be, wouldn't be rough. It would be a very specific set of, we think this would work. Here's a bunch of, a series of recommendations with financial, operational and other considerations taken into account. You would provide feedback 
They would then do a handoff to a third phase, which would bring us back to probably a two student internship team whose primary job would be to take your feedback, our, all of our research and generate the final written report, which would be a summer deliverable. But coming out of that end of the April or May commitment, you'd already know what you'd expect to see in it. You'd have seen it in a presentation form. This would generate a final written report that you could then use as a formal document to work off of as you continue your planning. So this is a timeline. There's a lot of pieces in here that need to be fleshed out. And quite frankly, um, that's where I'm very excited to then get our two students up and running. Because as I said, Brooke and I get to walk away, kind of help them think about things. And then they do all the heavy lifting from there forward. But they would, they would really bring a lot of detail to this that we could talk about in the November 2nd, um, your next meeting. So um, that I think was the full timeline. I'll, again, glad to take any questions, although I'm gonna leave the, the timeline up because there may be questions about that. But if there's any questions you have for Brooke or for me or suggestions, ideas, um, we're, we're open to listening. We, again, this is our first cut, not be a final product. I, I have a question. Am I muted or not? Okay. Um, it's more for Gary. I think, um, so I think you, uh, as you know, that there was a vendor chosen, um, but the town council didn't uh, forward them, you know, didn't allocate the money for us to use. So that bid, Gary, can they use that as a guide or is that proprietary? Gary? Gary? Yep, I didn't realize the, I was the, muted. Too. Yeah, the, the bid that was awarded, yep, I heard can you. that be used as a guideline for them or is that proprietary? A guideline in terms of a timeline or? or in terms no, of more or less that's, it was chosen because that's what we were looking for. Can that, yeah, be, I mean, they don't have to start from scratch, in other words? Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, every, cons, every consultant is going to have their own approach. Um, you have to keep in mind that the dollar amount that the cons you're talking about full-time individuals who could be dedicated to being in the community and the type of process that they'd go through would be a little bit different. Just kind of reviewing and I'm squinting to see because it's a small screen, although I guess I can bring up the larger one on mine. Um, very, it's a different timeline, but very similar approach obviously we did do some conversation we've we've as a group had some conversation about the social media aspect and kind of developing that community uh feedback um i think in here looking under like phase um phase 2a and 2b you have a lot of those community feedback gathering focus groups i think what i'm seeing here is more of a condensed version of what um Flick and Dodson. I think that's the one that we picked. Flicker and Dodson, Flick and Dodson um, had done. So we have agreed to kind of provide um, Kevin and company kind of the top three, mm -hmm. for three or four that we picked just so that he can see and kind of get a feel for it. Um, although again, that's probably a much, much larger magnitude, but I think that the university has the ability to achieve um, those same, they're going to do it more from a grassroots approach um, and some uh, still with that level of due diligence in terms of um, seeing what other communities have done and a level of analysis to apply what other communities have done to what we're looking to do, what our possible scenarios could be. So I guess the short answer of that is it's not proprietary, but it, it may be different in the end, um, but still advantageous to the community as a whole or to the, the decision makers as a whole. Okay. So can, jump in with just to uh, add on to that, so Gary um, did indicate he would share those, those um, not just the number one, but some of the others with us as well. And so let me kind of walk through from a learning perspective, what our intention would be to, to let the, the phase one team of two take a run at it without looking at those reports at first. So there's always a learning component. I don't want them just to sort of crib from those. So, and they might have some interesting alternative ways to look at things. We will, Brooke and I will have, have them with us. Mm -hmm. When I see kind of a first or second draft, we plan to share those with them to say, here's some ways that others have approached it. And we can even say, here's the one that was certainly the choice of the town of Wethersfield. 
what's missing, what's so that they get, they learn kind of what was what what items might be added, what might be um, missing, and also say, all right, and what's realistic. So we will come back to you in the next month or so and say these are the things, and and I'm I'm gonna I can assure you students will do extraordinary level of work, but they're in a learning. Yeah. So the process will be definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, in some instances, it's, there may be components that we just can't deliver. There may be some things they can do that a consulting firm wouldn't do, by the way, as well. Um, so we will, but by the time we got the sort of phase one deliverable layout for you later in November, so we'll meet in, the, in November, but something in later in November, you'll be able to make a comparison, say, yep, we're getting this, this, and this. This may not be there, but we'll also have an explanation for you why it might not be either feasible or why the students might want to go in a slightly different direction. We do try mm -hmm. to give them a reasonable amount of autonomy too to be yeah and have an alternative approach. Does that help a, a little bit, Dan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is Pam Rowe. I just wanted to say, uh, Gary, you were right. This is a uh, this is such a win win. Thank you so much for your presentation, Brooke and Kevin. That was wonderful. Um, I was just wondering, is it too premature to ask how you would reach out to the community to get their feedback? I mean, with COVID and everything, would it be a survey monkey or something like that? Um, Kevin, do you, um, I'm happy to take part of that if you'd like. Um, well, I'll let you, because you know the community, and then there are some, we've had, so just to, just to be really clear, we've been working on a bunch of projects where we had to, we had to pivot in the last um, nine months now, is it six months, whatever, it feels yeah. like six years, whatever, nine years. <laughs> in the COVID-19 environment, we've pivoted and found ways to uh, accomplish this kind of feedback gathering. We're student, when I say we, students imp mm -hmm. implemented feedback gathering. So yeah, you might use tools like SurveyMonkey, but I, we, I think that the, there are some significantly robust tools that we already have that allow for breakouts and you can function, you can actually do almost everything you might have done in a, in a live room where you might have had people come into a main room and then break them into smaller groups. And if we manage our teams correctly, can have, uh, can get you a pretty solid level of, of, of information. We obviously will take your lead in terms of what works in the community. And that's why I'm going to turn to Brooke, who's obviously both part of the community and also plays a role in a sort of a parallel role with your work. So she probably has a better sense of what might might fly in, in weather fields. Yeah. Um, th thanks, Kevin. I, I was going to say that I think it's important that we let students take the lead with all of the resources that are available to us, especially knowing that there are some people who might actually still want to gather in a socially distanced way because that's how they are most comfortable. I don't want any resident of Weathersfield to say they didn't feel comfortable or didn't have an opportunity to have a say or to hear um, about what was happening. So um, our thoughts are we would uh, leverage Zoom webinars where we could do some basic presentations and then perhaps issues that are of uh, most importance to some uh, residents, they could go into chat rooms about that facilitated by our student workers or others, perhaps even on this committee. Um, yes, there might be some questionnaires, but I think um, our very strong communications um, and public relations students might come up with some really fantastic That's, ways for us to make sure that we yeah. have we, we have and will reach everybody. Um, so it might not just be that one or two listening sessions at town hall, but we might do some gatherings in different kind of ways on ground, mm -hmm. online, perhaps through some email. We all know that um, we all need a few different reminders and a few different opportunities to participate. And we would wanna make sure that this is no different than any of those other listening sessions that the town has held in the past. Thank you. And I have a question. I'm just gonna add one, one thought to what Brooke said. One thing that we have is a limitation, but I'll tell you what the, over, the way to overcome it is, is that we have um, at least currently taken the position that we will not ask students to do, even on a social distance basis, on-site work related to our experiential work. They're remote. That said, I already have, I have a small business practice in working with students up and down up Upper Albany in Hartford. Um, and I go to socially distanced meetings where we then have the students come on remotely. So uh, this is, and it's primarily because what we don't want to do is say to a student, you need to make, in order to be part of this project, you need to make a commitment to something that you may or may not be comfortable. And we don't want to increase the risk. I mean, I, I can manage the risk probably more effectively than a student can. So 
um, that's where we could be, we could do some social distance. Um, yep. It might mean, you know, Brooke or I might be the people standing in the room while the students are coming in remotely, um, but we would, we would make that work. Sorry, to, sorry, Mary, I, I know you had a question. I just want oh, no, to- okay. um, The question that I had was around um, just the connection points with the committee. Um, and I suppose that's Gary's, Gary, you'll probably be involved in, and I'm just thinking of things like, you know, when we have to give updates to the town council. Um, and some of the ideas, aside from just the meetings, and maybe the meetings are the mechanism for this, but um, some of the ongoing kind of things we've been doing um, on our own with, you know, talking to various, uh, you know, we, we did a walk of the property. We've got some per people in, in town um, who gave us some information on farming, um, other ideas that we may have. How do we, how do we make those uh, connections with your team? Um, Gary, I, unless you have something you'd like to say, I think so far on Friday, we were chatting with Cindy and Gary. Okay. Um, unless otherwise directed, I would see us and perhaps most importantly, um, the lead students um, reporting in in some way, in some fashion that the committee directs us whether that is a check-in via video, whether that is email. I think that like all consultants, we wanna check in and provide details to you in a way that's most meaningful to you and makes it easy for you to update the council and other people who would be involved. Yeah, that's fair. I, I was just trying to get a sense of how we keep that information sharing because you know, we have these meetings monthly, we talk um, and we may go walk the property and we've got different ideas floating out there. And I'm sure Gary, between Gary and Cindy, you'll get a good sense of what those are, but just curious. Yeah, and just, just to be clear, I don't want, and Cindy, I, I mean, I'll speak for me. I don't want to be the gatekeeper of necessarily information preventing stuff flowing. So I have no issue with them attending. I mean, this is a Keisha Farms committee. If they want to attend the meetings and, um, and participate to the level that they think is appropriate. I mean, I, I kind of visualize this having check-ins Right. This is they, they pulled the contract. They pulled the information. Now they go back and do some research, and maybe there's they're touching base with us to help us. We can help guide them along. Well, we're looking a little bit more for this, or could you find out more about that? So I don't, I don't necessarily see me being a filter of information, although I can. I I just I like the open dialogue. I can perhaps make a suggestion from some experience that was similar to this. We worked with a, an organization. Um, that I was actually involved with, but then subsequently had a student project work with a strategic review for Develop Springfield up in Springfield. Um, it was for the board of directors of Develop Springfield, um, and it was a and Develop Springfield is a is a nonprofit, but it's jointly govern. It's a public sector and private sector, both money and public sector involvement. So it's not subject to open meeting rules, but it is. Um, it, it, it's, it works closely with the city of Springfield. What we found worked really well in that instance is that the CEO of Develop Springfield served as, it, it, as co-point with someone from the committee. So, so there, was a, there was a single point of contact for the sort of what I would call regular check-ins to say, we think that's something the committee is at large ought to see. So we have these larger milestone dates, but those aren't the only time that the students can be available to you. But it's hard for the students to know that something might need to be elevated. And um, so the board, in that instance, wanted to have someone who was kind of the, the, that the board, in this case, the committee's point person. But, you know, the counterpart to Gary was also involved in those conversations. And they might do a, you know, 15-minute phone call every, every week or a half-hour phone call. But it would, it would at least highlight when something needed to be elevated. That's one model that worked really well. It streamlines it. It doesn't mean that you need to host a full meeting. I don't know if that, I don't know how that works with public meeting rules, but it might allow you to say, yes, we need to go to the full committee or yes, we need to call a larger group or yes, we're going out to the site and we'd like to have people who can join us, join us, those sorts of things. Um, that, all, that worked really well because it meant that there wasn't, the committee of the board knew that they weren't getting things through a lens that was separate from theirs, but they also knew that, um, you know, they could keep the process moving. 
Just one other thought, a segueing from several of your different comments, but starting really with Mary's thought, how do we convey some of the information we've already um, assessed? One of the things that was in many of the proposals was the idea of holding meetings for stakeholders. Um, and I guess by that they meant um, members, for example, the neighbors, or when this uh, referendum took place, it was for recreational purposes so that we have several sports clubs and, and uh, in the community that might be interested. It was intended for agricultural purposes. So we recently walked with someone that had experience in that. So your students might, they might not even want to incorporate this, but it could be something maybe you could, you know, suggest to them that there might be different focus groups that they could hold independently as well. But just a thought, I mean, just, just a thought. We really are trying to get the community's input, you know, and, and, uh, in every way possible. Great, great, great suggestion. And, and that's where the open-ended focus groups leaves room for both what I would call broad focus groups. Those can be people who, you know, a group of seven or eight people who represent just broadly the community. And then you can also have focus groups where you say, this is a group that is specifically interested in say athletics and, mm -hmm. and health and fitness. And so they can learn, because the point of a focus group from larger information gathering just to put it into some context is the focus group is where you tend to put small proposals in front of a group and just let them brainstorm as opposed to a larger group which is where you generate the things that go in front of a focus group so you get a sort of a giant mass of ideas then you say well here's some of those that are very specific to say physical well-being health and wellness then you get a group of six or seven key stakeholders in a room and they participate in that conversation. It gives you a refinement process, and you do that more than once. So the phase 2A and phase 2B both presume some of that will happen both times because you get a different kind of refinement. So that would be that would work really well. I suspect the students will, will adopt something like that. Um, <clears throat> if I could just say that uh, the person we walked with recently, Kip Kolosinskis, is a soil scientist, but also a Yukon farm consultant. And since this was a farm, we will want to get the expertise on agriculture in that wouldn't necessarily be in the community, but could be pointed out or shown to the community of what could be developed. And, and that's a department that you don't have on your campus, but you would want to reach out in that direction for sure. I think we would plan to leverage almost every connection that the community had to offer. And that is, we would let the students navigate those opportunities. And so the fact that you've already had them on, on ground is, is, is fantastic. And if they're amenable to chatting with the team, I think that would be terrific. I'm sure that uh, Kip would be, for sure. Thank you. <clears throat> I just had one final question about the, the possibility of your students providing for the community some type of analysis of the property so that when the community comes to discuss it they have a sense of what where the wetlands are or where the topography wouldn't lend itself to do certain things um, when we when the farm came up for purchase we basically used a a, a graphic that came right off a uh, topographic a picture almost and they imposed lines on it so i don't think people have a really clear sense at all as to what's there in yeah. terms of you know, the land, the elevation, the uses, the potential uses. So if your students had the ability to do that, that would really help in the visioning as well. I think that's one of the benefits of having a visual communication design division and an art school um, illustration program that this would be something that the team would work on together. So not only are we doing research about economic development and land use, um, you know, the potential as well as the restrictions, you would have the creativity of a team thinking about how do we best share these details with our community. And like you said, you used what you had before. This allows for some really dynamic opportunities for students to apply what they've learned in the classroom um, with a community looking to make some decisions. And that's the dynamic kind of work we're talking about. And that's why we're really excited about what this means for our students. And then for the, for the residents to have a chance to see a presentation that is might be a little bit more than a than a static picture with a graph over it. Right. And we we also have civil engineering and architectural students. So when we say interdisciplinary, the ideal world is what what Brooke just described. You'd have 
someone who actually could look at topography maps and understand them, civil engineers, um, and then speak to our our artists and graphic design and architectural students and say, here's, we're gonna have to explain this, whatever it be, that this is, you know, that there's maybe an area that has um, a wetlands component that, you know, we need to be cognizant of as we think about planning because it may make issues, mm -hmm. issues from a parking perspective. I mean, there's any, so we do have students who have that expertise. And every time we say we have students, by the way, we're not gonna just let them on, you know, sort of loose, there will be faculty who will be looking at the work they're doing and saying, have you asked these three questions? Have you, we're, make, don't forget to consider. Remember that the, um, they do all the work and they do a lot, most of the thinking, but there are experts on our campus who can help them frame those kinds of issues as well. So, and then convert it into something that's meaningful to someone who isn't a civil engineer. That's where the artists and the communicators and marketing professionals and others can really be helpful as well. Are there any other questions for this team? Is everybody as excited as I am about the possibility? Yes. <laughs> this is awesome. This is absolutely fabulous. And Dan, you'll be um, you'll be interested to know that they asked if there was ever if there were any other town plans that they might be able to expose their students to, just to see you know how it turned out. And I said yes. There's a Millwoods master plan that I'm sure that you could share with them so they could see both the potential and the limitations that towns face in trying to implement some of these you know, wonderful ideas that you come up with. Yeah. So I know that they'll be happy to, to have your input too. Yeah, that, there's a Cove master plan and uh, there's a master plan for Spring Street and uh, everything pretty much. So that's great. I, I, Kathy Bagley has most of those right in her office in town hall, so that should be no problem. That'd be great. That actually serves two purposes. One, it gives our students a model for what might work. And quite frankly, for phase three also gives us a, a template for at least trying to answer the questions that historically you've considered important. You know, so when you think about a final report, it's a report, it's not a plan and not, but the more that we address critical questions that you've considered important in plans, the better that final document can be. So understanding what's worked in the past helps us put a quality document together for you as well. So that's great. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Can we move on to some other open business? Can we Gary? just say thank you? You don't, you don't if this is, I, I want to just say thank you for your time and we really appreciate having the opportunity to do this. Oh no, Brooke and Kevin, thank you both very much. I'm sure that um, we're going to, be talking to you and seeing you often. Wonderful. Looking forward to That's it. Thank good. you for your time, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So, Gary, do we have to do anything officially as a committee to try to accept that? Or, I mean, how, how should we proceed? I, maybe we need some open discussion first as to what people thought about what they proposed and their timeline. And, you know, of course, I wanted it yesterday, but next September will be okay, too. And uh, I think they're talking about deliverables very much in line with what we were looking for and getting from that Dodson and Flink, and even with right down to the artistic renderings. What do people think? Hi, Cindy. I, I think it's great. I, I, I feel like this feels more like a grassroots effort to me. Um, while I was listening to them, I was thinking to myself, what's going to be the role of this committee? How are we going to begin to unfold? I mean, I see that they have a plan set forward of what they're going to be doing for us, but what are we going to be doing as a committee? What are our roles going to be? I think we have a couple of other things that we can discuss under, under all business that might give us still some, um, some ways to keep moving forward while that were parallel to, to what they're doing. You know, so, um, and I think we ought to continue to move forward, trying to gather as much information, get community input. Um, can, I, can I discuss any of that? I don't want to move ahead of anybody else. Uh, in terms of the face, Gary, yes? Well, I was um, gonna, it depends if it's, so I could be the stickler for the rules, although I, I don't need to be. So if I think Tara raises a good, Tara, sorry, raises a good question 
Um, so if your question is, if your response is going to answer hers, um, I think, you know, if you tie the two together, that's great. But I think it's actually kind of a good question. What do we want as a committee to be working on um, okay. as we do it? And I do see some like, you know, same path. It's not like we're going separate paths. We're kind of in the same. So, okay, go ahead. So it, it actually does tie together. So as a committee, we had talked about the Facebook page and I had gone back and forth with Tara and Mary about it. And then this week I was invited to the Weathersfield Youth Advisory Board's Facebook page, to, invited to fight, like and follow it. And I can see that we can take a very similar path to what they did rather than remove all the history of what we did in the, the Keisha Farm for All page, we can ask those people to migrate over to a different page in which we can begin to try to put out to the public information about what we're doing. And so I think we can put that up right away. It, it'll be simpler, neater, cleaner. Um, we don't lose our history and we, we move forward engaging the community. Um, if I could, um, Jenna has agreed that she would provide us with some lifestyle and cooking and farm related uh, ideas. And she's already given me her first recipe and photo. So we can put up some things that are, have appeal to the community right away. We can use some of the pictures. Um, I also attended the Weathersfield Education Foundation uh, meeting and expressed to them our interest in at least trying to clean up that greenhouse. I, I call it the hoop house, but it's essentially that greenhouse in the back. And they were very excited. And if this committee agrees, we can have our first kind of public private partnership, they've agreed to put money towards the cleanup and restoration of that greenhouse. And, you know, I kind of went back and forth about thinking about it. Is it a problem if we do anything to alter the landscape of that farm until we know what, want, what we need, what the community input is on what we need there. But I, then I thought whatever improvement we made in that, would never be wasted. I mean, that would be something I think that would attract attention to the property and hopefully excite people about the possibilities. They've also agreed to fund curriculum writing for the elementary schools to write projects that could be used in that greenhouse. So that's a second thing that we could keep doing. And then I thought um, we might wanna try and get something like a founders campaign going for 2021. I mean, wait till they've started, but a founder's campaign is where you just ask people to make contributions, monetary, towards something. And if we had the greenhouse, we could make it towards that. And it, had, it could have different levels, and I could flesh it all out later. I don't want to bore anybody with it. But that would be our, some of the things I thought could be our parallel track. Cindy, I just, can I ask you, who, who was it that you met with? Educate, was it an educational? Weathersfield Education Foundation. Okay. Thank you. And they actually approved a partnership with us and they have money to put towards it. That project isn't huge financially, so it's not a huge investment, but I think it could really excite people if we did a little, you know, saw how it was transformed. Dan, you weren't with us on the walk. No, I didn't miss it. Boy Scouts could ever do that. It, it's not in the condition that yeah. a bunch of kids could take that on as a project. It, it's. Mm -hmm it's really overgrown and there's a lot of broken glass and things. Yeah, so it's probably not safe. It just didn't look like it would lend itself to a, a Boy Scout project, but I think- They are, um, you know, the way I think Kathy framed it to them is, are you interested in doing projects? And the answer was yes. So oh, we just have to come up with something and then, uh, you know, ask them. So okay. it, they, if this doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. That's, you know, that's fine. But I think it's uh, certainly uh, they're a resource we can count on. The other thing is if Eagle Scout projects, a lot of times they have to raise the money. So if there's something we see there that we think might be an Eagle Scout project, a lot of times they raise the money. It doesn't really cost the town anything. So. Okay. Well, there I'm sure there'll be things that we see. I mean, you need those seed stands and you need mm -hmm. hoses and water and plastic yeah. for the roof, but it could be a, a combined project. So Tara, in answer to your question, those were some of the things I thought we could still continue to do. And Jim, I don't, I'm not Jim, uh, Gary, I don't know if you had a report from Marina about the barn and if it, if it was worthy of historic designation or not. You don't have an update from her. I think you sent her an email, but I don't think she had responded. Okay. 
So maybe we'll bug her a little bit because that had a time um, element to it. We, if we wanted to do anything free, it had to be done this year. So that's October, November, December now. So maybe we'll get back to her. But those are some of the things we could move forward doing. And then we'll be giving input to the students, I would think. And uh, does that seem like enough? Is there what any about the, were we going to reach out to the schools on the logo or uh, like kind of a drawing of the barn or some kind of a thing for the Facebook page? Or we want to wait a little bit on that? No, I think that's a great idea. We could even do a t-shirt. I mean, if we... So I had some preliminary conversations with the school. Um, Mike Emmett is kind of working through something with, oh my God, I can't think of the teacher's name right now, um, in terms of contact. My only, and it's not even a hesitation, I want to, we need to figure out what we're going to do with if we're gonna go forward with the University of Hartford and some specific activities for them, and there might be an interaction or an engagement, I don't, I wanna make sure we're clear, like, so we're gonna have the high school kids do some marketing and logo stuff, we don't wanna step on you, or you need to figure out how to integrate this with that, because otherwise we're, we're kind of overlapping unfairly for the project. Um, but I think that's a detail we can work out over the next, I don't have the timeline in front of me anymore, but 30 to, 60 days um, in terms of who's going to do what and how we integrate it. And frankly, again, when we're talking about community or grassroots and creating pathways, now you can, now you have a high school student that can match up with a career or a college path or, um, you know, connectivity. So I think That's there's, really there's kind of some levels here. Um, you know, I, I will mention, be careful how many things you want to put on your plate in the order in which we put them. So, it's fine to find work to do, but obviously if we're going to put money into the um, greenhouses, if we're going to do any kind of connectivity, we, we have to have a conversation about how we do it and, and get approvals. Because again, it's still town property. So all great ideas, all good matchmaking opportunity. We just have to kind of work it through a process uh, before we say go, um, just what to make sure. Process? Just out of curiosity, what, if, what is the process? Not sure of that yet. I have to kind of take a step back and think a little bit about those next steps, right? So if they're going to put money into it, are they going to require that, you know, what are the terms and conditions? Can we um, not do anything with that building for a certain period of time? What happens if it comes down? Do we have to pay it back? Is it truly a grant? If we're doing programming, do we have the right, I don't want to call it insurances, but liability protection in place to allow programming to run there? What's the programming going to look like? Do we have funding for the program? So there's a lot of great ideas, but um, I hate, I'm not looking to throw up barriers. I'm looking to come up with, uh, here's an issue and here's how we solve it more than anything. So, um, which could be a conversation for, for a meeting to figure out what are those next steps and how do we do it? Unfortunately, the wheels of government turn slower than we all would like, but there's <laughs> reasons for it. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're protecting the 26,000 residents in the town from potential harm. Do we have to go before the town council for this group, the University of Hartford group, or are we the, who decides that we're going to go with them? It would, uh, my thought is it does not, I'm saying this knowing full well I might eat crow, but I do not believe we need council concurrence because it's an ad hoc committee of the town manager. And depending upon what we work out for an agreement with them in terms of class credit versus stipends or a combination of the two, I think it's within my approved budget. So I don't need an allocation, um, but it would be in the best interest of the committee and probably my career if we at some point did go in front of the council to just do a Keisha Farms update as to where we are. Um, and I haven't really given much thought to the timeline on that just yet, uh, but it would be sooner rather than later, but I, I'm still trying to tighten things down with the University of Hartford. Um, sorry, I had a council member trying to call me, so. Tara, does that answer what, what you thought? I mean, do you have any other ideas as to what we might be doing while this is going on? I, I guess until we start to see how everything else unfolds with the University of Hartford, I guess we're just going to have, we'll pivot and, mm -hmm. and adjust once we begin to start 
actually moving in emotion and moving forward? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think in terms of emotion, it would probably be, um, again, you know, authorizing the town manager or, you know, to, uh, to engage the University of Hartford in a uh, memorandum of agreement to provide services, you know, related to the presentation. Um, yeah, I mean, I basically, if this group feels comfortable with the University of Hartford, I will finish the, you know, we're, we've just got to get some legal things out of the way. They require an MOU because obviously they're going to, students are going to be part of this, so they need to have certain protections in place, and the town does as well, so that if a student gets hurt while doing this, we're not exposing the town to a liability. So I can make that motion. If, if if you feel that that would be the, the appropriate thing to do. So let me move that um, I would like to authorize town manager Gary Evans to proceed with the University of Hartford to create a memorandum of, what was that? Memorandum, uh, memorandum of agreement or understanding. To provide uh, services in response to the request for proposals. Is that okay? Authorize the town manager to all right. Yeah, to University of Hartford to generate a memorandum of agreement based on the RFP. Yeah. Maybe, does that make sense, Gary? Does that have yep. everything you want in it? Yep. Or in it? That works. Okay. I think because we're recorded, we have a good intent as to what you're trying to get me to do. Okay. It's clean enough. Is there a second? Second. second. All right. Discussion. Any discussion? Reservations? Just nothing? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 You went in there, you were nine, you come out, you're 18. Wait, is no, that go it? Around. Go around. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. Motion passes unanimously. So I will get that together um, with Kevin and Brooke. Hopefully, I'm looking at a calendar. Hopefully, in the next week or two, we'll have something kind of solidified. Um, and we, we can, um, trying to think how to do this, you know, maybe come up with a short list of next steps. Um, they're working on getting their students together. We can figure out how we want to approach the, uh, well, obviously we still need to get the, the conversation about the barn needs to be accomplished. So that would be a good target for November. And that would probably be something that you'd want to go to council with um, probably before their November meeting. So ideally, if we can get something from the state by next week, I can get it on the agenda for the 20th or at the very latest November 2nd for them to allow us to apply for um, if they so decide to apply for designation. And I think that should probably be your focus for October, November, in addition to getting the University of Hartford online. What about the Weathersfield Education Foundation's offer for financial assistance? Um, so you'd probably want to work through the what? What is it that we're trying to do? That would probably be also a council conversation. So you could try to target them both at the same time. So maybe it's a it's a presentation at a council meeting and then an actual action at a council meeting to authorize us to do those things. Okay. So they would be authorizing us to do those things and to accept the grant from the Weathersville Education Foundation. Yep. Apply for and accept right. to provide the following. Okay. Okay. Jim, can Kip help us at all with what the needs to are for that restoration of that hoop house? Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Send us in the right direction for someone who's done. Yeah, we think so. I mean, uh, he looked at it, so he knows what it looks like and would know what it, what it would uh, what require, perhaps. Um, I, I have a report prepared when you're ready to hear it on Kip's visit and his observations on uh, property and possibilities for ag agricultural education or agriculture itself. I would love the people from the University of Hartford to hear that. So I'm glad that I think they, sh they need to hear that too. So that's great. Yeah. Um, 
do you do you want me to is this the right place in the agenda or well no why would you want to make that part of our next month's agenda i mean that could well, be our so far we've the agenda seems to have been lending themselves to one large discussion and then taking care of business uh -huh. okay well i guess one of the th one of his comments was he'd like to come back when there and and look at the soils while there's moisture in it as opposed to pure dust when we were there before um so I, we could make this more complete, I think, by next month. Okay. Uh, and that would be useful. I could send you, uh, I'll, I'll send around the email with, uh, with some comments and so forth. All right, great. Great. And I will send up a little mock-up of a founders campaign for 2021, where people could contribute at different levels to try and help fund you know, some of the activities that are taking place there. Tara, did you want to give any um, information to the group on any kind of that you, we talked about that coupon book or raising money through the community? And I know we're not there yet, but I know you, you went out and kind of did some groundwork. Um, a little bit. I think we just need to get through the next couple of months. I know you and I talked about it. I think there is a great opportunity to go back to some store owners, maybe maybe gathering some of them together and, and um, pitching our, you know, what we want to do over there at the farm. Um, but I, I could sense everyone is just working very hard to skip through the next month to two months. So um, I definitely think if we are focusing on 2021, I think there are a lot of opportunities with business owners in town. Um, I just don't think people's minds are focused on it this second. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah, it does. It's, it's incredibly realistic, too. It'd be very hard to ask people for large donations of goods or services or money. So, especially when we don't know yet what we're doing. But, I mean, the community hasn't really weighed in yet on what we're doing. Right. I think it's appropriate. But I'm, thank you for having those initial discussions. It'll be nice to go back to them with something much more concrete. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think we'll see that, you know, we're going to get, I believe we're, we'll get a lot of good feedback and people wanting to be involved. We just have to make the story and be right on about what our pitch is going to be. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Is there any correspondence? Did we receive any, any nice, warm, fuzzy cards? Any other business? Well, all right. We know when our next meeting is, Gary, I'm supposed to remind you to- There is other business. Yep. For next year. So that was the other business. Sorry. Couldn't speak fast enough. Uh, this is a time of year where we usually try to set the schedule for the following year because we have to get that to the printer so we could do that wonderful marketing piece and calendar for all the meetings. So um, typically it would be through a motion, but I don't know if the the first Monday of every month has been working for everyone. If they want to make changes to it, um, it's it's a little interesting for me only because there's always a council meeting that follows. But other than budget season, I think um, I figured out ways to handle it. My only thing would be you move it. Do you move it 15 minutes early, officially 15 minutes earlier, or to five o'clock? Uh, but if we needed to keep 5:30, we can do that. Um, it just means I will typically dip out at 6:45. Just to put this out there, I don't know if it's good for everyone else, but I wouldn't mind if the meeting started a little earlier. Wouldn't bother me either if that made it more convenient, and especially for um, thinking about the University of Hartford and the students coming to make presentations to us. We really need Gary there, you know, so we want to make it easy for you, Gary, too, to be there for the entire meeting. So if starting at five made a difference, we could certainly do that. Well, and some of those University of Hartford visits might be separate meetings altogether because you're going to want community input. But but I, I can be flexible. I'll, there's nine of you, so. I could do it. Could do uh, that. We're all here and, and uh, flexible, but maybe the people, some of the people aren't here couldn't be earlier, but they're not here anyway, I guess. Dan, does five work for you? I can do five. I really can't do any earlier than that because I won't be home from work. Okay. And I know Mike Orsini can usually be here, but he said he forgot about the meeting and he scheduled an appointment at five. So 
he must have gotten held up. Otherwise, he's he's a really faithful follower. So, so this is in the new year, right? Or or now? New starting Effect, January. Effective January, January one. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll meet at five o'clock, and then we'll schedule additional meetings as needed with the University of Hartford for visioning sessions or whatever yep. you know, they come up with. Sounds good. So, Cindy, the next park board meeting. Um, what? We've got another, you know, a park board meeting every month. I was wondering if you could attend and just give an update on the, uh, you know, a little more detailed uh, on the farm, because we do have an update every uh, meeting on it. So I know you have a little more details than I do. So if you can, it's just the same to. thing, just a Zoom meeting that we call in. It lasts about an hour. Gary, are you okay with that? What's that, giving an update? Okay with that? Dan asked me if I would represent the farm committee at a park and rec board. Sure. Okay. When's, when's the next meeting? I just want to make sure the word about the consultant gets to at least the mayor before, mayor and council members before it gets to the rest of the... I think it's the third week. Is it the third week in every month? Yeah, we should be fine. Third or fourth week, I'm not sure which. Yep, we should be fine. Because I've had some preliminary conversations with both the, the mayor and uh, deputy mayor about it, so... We should be okay. I just want to make sure, you know, they understand the most recent update where we are and where we're looking to go. And in fact, I'm at the next council meeting on October 19th, I could potentially do a town manager's report, include an update as to where we're at. I would think that they would think this is an extraordinary win-win situation. I mean, I understand how they really felt that they could not fund the consultant because of the constraints, budget constraints, the situation that we're in. But for you to have found what potentially I could see could be even better than the consultants we were getting, for you to have found these students and the variety of information that they're going to give us, the, the skills that they're going to have, have it be really community-based, I would think that, that they would be really pleased to hear what you're going to say. Let's see if I'm right. <laughs> Let's hope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a good, it's a good switch from, um, you know, it's some savings and so, and uh, as I think Tara mentioned it, it's a community grassroots focus. So mm -hmm. I think that's a nice change. Um, just before I forget, if we could just do a motion for uh, the schedule change effective January, you know, make a motion effective January 1 for our, what are we, a monthly meeting on the first Monday of every month now at five, effective January 1. OK, who wants to make the motion? So moved. All right. Second. 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 All, the, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. OK, good. Motion passes unanimously. All right, do we have any comments from the public? Gary, you, you're going to have like a six minute break. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to run very quickly to the bathroom. Just <laughs> like a teacher. And then I'm going to go to council. Council, Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I can't help but be excited. I mean, I thought that not getting the consultant was a big setback, and it looks like this is actually going to potentially be better than what we had. So I'm very excited. Um, Jenna, you're going to see yourself next week. I've got the, your recipe, and I'll have that Facebook up. Does anyone object to being listed as a member of the committee on the Facebook page? Not at all. Text, you sure? No, Only no. If it's a bad life. recipe. Short <laughs> biography, a wish list. Anyone have a wish list you want me to put up? All right. Well, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Jim, second. Pam, you look happy. Second the motion. I'm, if you can imagine, I'm running around babysitting as I'm on this call. <laughs> I, I thought it was actually so, yeah, I'll it. second and third the motion. <laughs> it, looks, it looks like, Pam, the baby's carrying you around. <laughs> he's right, he's oh. right there. <laughs> That's cute. That's cute. Charlie. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Gary. Thank you all. <laughs>